Namaste. I'm Emmanuel Lebrun Damien. I'm the director of the French Institute in India. And it's a great pleasure to welcome you to this symposium this afternoon at uh, this beautiful place. Um, this takes place uh, in the framework of the 24 Indian edition of the exhibition Art de Vivre à la Française. You know that uh, a similar initiative was uh, launched and happened in uh, many cities in the world, including Tokyo, Berlin, New York, Singapore. And it seems natural to uh, add uh, Delhi to this map, considering the importance of this topic uh, in the Indian culture, which is a big, big common point between France and India. Um, I hope you had the opportunity to see the exhibition uh, next door. If not, uh, I really encourage you to go and, and, and see what uh, the French companies have uh, brought together. Uh, it's really a, a wonderful showcase of uh, what the uh, community of French and Indian creators can do uh, and uh, how they meet in their taste and um, talent and professionalism in all these fields. Um, I have to say that um, this uh, initiative is at the core of one of our top priorities, that is to say the preservation and valorization of craftsmanship. I've been in India for four years and I will never be tired of observing this amazing talent pool in craftsmanship uh, in arts and crafts. And uh, with the whole team at the French Institute in India, uh, we find a lot of pleasure uh, in uh, connecting French and Indian artists, craftsmen, uh, companies and uh, developing projects from uh, the artistic perspective until the business um, objective. One example of that, perhaps you heard the ambassador mention it yesterday, it is the Villa Swagatam. We uh, created a network of Indian organization and residencies as well as French organization and residencies who are ready to welcome every year on the long term one resident from the other country to work on arts and crafts. In that framework, we had the pleasure to welcome the young and talented designer Victoire de Brandt, who was hosted in Chennai for three months last year by our residency partner, Vastrakala Le Sage Intérieur, who will be represented in today's panel by Jean-François Le Sage. Similarly, for the second edition of Villa Swagatam, we will initiate a collaboration with Jaipur Rugs, from which you can admire a few creations in the ballroom display, and whose artistic director, Greg Foster, will be moderating one of today's roundtables. To continue uh, in the Villa Swagatam family, I would also like to acknowledge the presence of our partners here of Mobilier National, represented here in the Delhi today by Emmanuel Petit de Mange and Loïc Turpin. In 2024, they will have the opportunity to welcome an Indian designer in residence and to prepare for the major arts and crafts exhibition that they will host in the, at the end of the year 2025, as announced by President Macron when he visited India earlier this year. So by creating these uh, creative dialogues, we wish to inspire professionals, but we don't forget students as well. It is our goal to host, to welcome more and more Indian students to France. Uh, he didn't, uh, talked a lot about it as well when he visited um, uh, India in January. This is uh, the occasion for me to uh, mention uh, the Design Village with whom we work very, very closely and who's a, a strong uh, member of this initiative as well. And I would like to announce um, the launch of Design en Residence doesn't work anymore. So, Design en Residence Jaipur is a residency program between the students of Ecole Boulle, Paris, and NID Ahmedabad. Uh, this residency will take place during the second semester of 2024 and will be co curated and mentored by Rowin Atelier, a French architecture studio who will be presenting their work later on this conference, and the beloved Indian designer Gunjan Gupta. Through this kind of initiative, we wish to encourage future professional vocations by broadening the creative horizons for the students of our two countries, but we also intend to strengthen professional training in craftsmanship, a crucial field for the histories, cultures and economies of France in India. This ambition also extends to the sphere of architecture, as we have the pleasure to welcome today several prominent figures in the field, Jean-Louis Deniaux, 
Borina Andrieux from the Vilmot studio and also Sonali Rastoki. We intend to draft a new roadmap for um, the Franco-Indian cooperation in architecture and this roadmap will include some of the most prestigious architecture schools and professionals from our two countries. So in a nutshell, this afternoon we are going to talk about, to talk about one of our most uh, cherished topic with uh, many of our beloved partners in this beautiful place. So I think you will have a very good and fruitful afternoon. Thank you very much. Now we will welcome the first panelist on stage, so please come in. Thank you very much all of you for attending this first panel with our specialist and, and guests who I will introduce right now without losing any, any time. Um, so we have today um, among, uh, with us Borina, Borina Andrieux, she's here. She's the managing director at Villemotte & Associés, as we said. Uh, this uh, firm, architectural firm, has been created in 1975 by Jean-Michel Jean Villemotte. The practice uh, five main business activities are architecture, interior architecture, urban planning, museography and design. Uh, so it's a very wide uh, range of activities and you'll get uh, a glimpse of it through the presentation of Borina. Uh, it's a com cosmopolitan network also, which has offices in France, United Kingdom, Italy, Brazil, South Korea, uh, and which bring together more than 270 employees around the world. So Borina has been with this firm for the past 20 years, if I'm correct. So you know a lot <laughs> about this story. Then we have this today, Gaurav Gupta. So I don't know if I should introduce Gaurav Gupta to our Indian audience or not, but I'm still going to do it because it's a tricky exercise. Uh, he's a couturier and an artist based out of New Delhi who co-founded his label in 2005 along with his brother after graduating from Central St. Martins. Uh, the brand's cultural silhouettes are known to create magic on iconic red carpets all over the world. I'm sure you know it. And that's also the idea of inviting Gaurav today is about opening this talk on the shapes, the style, the architecture to other practitioners and what is the dialogue that is happening maybe between you as a fashion designer, the way you perceive that discipline and you integrate it in your work, in your everyday work. Uh, and you have also just to say Gorav is a special friend of friends in a sense that since 2022 he's been invited by Fédération de la Haute Couture in Paris to show his work uh, each season. So you are able to build that cultural bridge, and I thank you for that. Then we have here uh, Sonali Rastogi. Sonali, I thank you very much for coming with us today. It was very important also for me to have a balance between French speakers, Indian speakers, to be able to create a real dialogue between uh, Indian vision of what is architecture today, and you've been like a, a very prominent actor in that field, I can say. You operate as an architect, an urban designer, and planner, artist, writer, speaker, and innovator. A lot of ads for one person. And you are the co-founding partner of the architectural firm Morphogenesis, who you all know, uh, which is uh, based in New Delhi and uh, Bangalore, if I'm correct. And Mumbai. I was missing one office. So thank you all of you for being there today and for sharing a bit of your thoughts, your magic with us. Um, without any uh, further um, time, I, will, I would like to dig into the subject, which is considering the very rich diversity of our panelists today, I was asking myself what would be the thread and how to connect all of your work together. And it seems to me that the main problematic was that all of you are really specialists in exploring cross-cultural influences in your work and in your respective creative process. And I think that's what I want to start with by giving ladies first the mic to Borina so she can explain maybe a bit. I had this first question for you going through the many, many work of, uh, of uh, Villemotte. I had the question about the diversity of project and when you dive into a new project, how do you work with cultural specificities on the ground, singularities of a place, of a context, 
and also how do you build the basis for dialogue with local stakeholders like you would be doing maybe tomorrow in India if you had some projects in India and you're also known very well for specific reuse of existing buildings which are given a new identity through the work of your firm. What is the process around that and can you tell us a bit more? First of all, uh, thank you very much. I think it's a great opportunity. I'm so pleased to be here in India. It's a country that I admire. Should I say a continent that I, I admire a lot? I think you have a fantastic culture, background, and a hospitality that is really unique, and it gives a lot of warmth. It's not only through the food, but also the way you hug people, and I love that. So this is a little bit. Uh, so uh, I've been uh, in this company for 20 years. Uh, Wilmot uh, is um, international practice, but we, if I if I say something, this is our main office in Paris. We have different, uh, we work in 30 countries and we are enough crazy to push the projects from a huge master plan that, for instance, the greater Moscow area, which was 268,000 hectares, and the smallest one was a, um, a pastry shop for one of the biggest chefs in France, Guy Savoy, 17 square meters. So there is no, you know, we, we like to do this kind of jump uh, and uh, I think today we have a big responsibility. Architects and urban planners and designers and people of taste and we are all here that, uh, to make people feel in a better way, to live in a better way, to dress in a better way. You know, when I'm in a bad mood and uh, something like that, I go to the hairdresser and buy myself a new outfit. So. Uh, this is the way. So the, this is how I rehabilitate myself. But um, I think it's really, today the rehabilitation, it's something that it's the real eco effort that everyone should do. Because first of all, I'm going to show you, for instance, what we could do with the one part of the Louvre, which was before the Ministry of uh, Finance. And you, it was in a very bad condition. And uh, I was telling today to some students that some of the functionaries there, the employees, they, the civil servants, they didn't want to leave and they attached themselves to the radiator. This is what we did. This is the first of a row of museums that we did uh, in a very contemporary way because all the security went out and so the showcases become very light, very transparent, because the museum, it's my motto, are made for two things, for the artwork and for the visitor. The architect should disappear, because we should be the medium between the artwork and the public. And we, may, uh, we managed to do with this museum the for the first time, we sacralize the primitive art. So here, for instance, in Beijing, something that you know very well, there are many of our colleague architects do this in India. It's a former weapon factory. We made out of this in 14 months, one of the biggest contemporary arts foundation. And Collège de Bernardin, it's a building from 1307. Um, in the center of Paris, it was a convent, uh, and then we did a completely new structure so to, to, to give the original volume of the building, and then <coughs> we, uh, we kind of put some auditorium inside the building, was in a horrible shape. We restored it, uh, and there was a fire brigade inside. They had even cut the columns. So we restored everything. So how to give a second life to a building, a bunch of building, with uh, the technology of today without pastiche? This is the Lalique, because we are in the luxury, so I try to do something that is related to luxury. So a new building, what we call the architectural graft, and the presence of landscape, which is for us, uh, and we can't do a project without landscape and art. So Musée d'Orsay, well, after 20 years of Gaolenti, we completely renovated the space for Impressionists. They actually never painted for white walls. So this is how it looks today. So you can focus really on the artwork. 
and uh, this is one of the longest projects um, in the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. The only uh, piece that remained at the original place is the Night Watch, and we are still now, uh, the, it's under restoration, and we did a sh huge sh showcase so people can see the restoration uh, under, uh, under process. So about, uh, for the amateurs of wine, how to give wings to an old building, with a glass structure to increase it. Believe it, it's a very good wine, but it's clo, you can trust me on that. Um, and this is a, something that can interest you a lot. It's a, a, a former station, train station for goods, so the trucks were coming to take what the train were delivered. And uh, it is the biggest digital incubator in the world. And it was designed by Eugène Fressinet in 1927. It was extremely innovative because you have pre um, uh, concrete thickness of five centimeters, knowing that the length of this building is the length of the, 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 the Eiffel Tower, 310 meters long. So we dug underneath to do an auditorium and everything, because it's a historical monument, could be dismantled and removed. So you have 3,500 3, people work, young people working there, and it's a restaurant that called Felicita, um, which works 24 hours a day. But in terms of hospitality, because um, it's something that uh, we bring, you see, this kind of French touch maybe, but the most important thing, it's our local partners. Uh, uh, here, we redid completely the things I was uh, uh, talking about, art. So there is an artist called Fabrice Hibert who did that. And um, uh, this is a campus, school campus, how to give natural light, how to make things more, I would say, less Corbusier sometimes, in the sense that you have to love people to do something that it's uh, comfortable and uh, to give them natural light. So this is a very interesting project uh, that we completely redid. We just kept one building, which is this one on the top from the 60s. And then this project was very hard to, it's very close to Monaco, between Monaco and um, um, and uh, Italy. So this is a stadium that we put our south office at in Nice. Believe me, everyone would like to go and work there. I don't know why, but uh, it's, uh, you have a, this stadium that was the first eco stadium in the world done with wooden structure. And uh, um, you know, it's a little bit of uh, bits and pieces that I'm showing, but I think it's very important to see how you can adapt your project to a place, even though it's a completely new construction, it has to talk with what is existing. And for instance, here it's the uh, King. Uh, we are at King's Cross, just opposite uh, Saint Pancras, the first building that you see getting off the train. Um, it was done for the BNP real estate, and actually was bought by Google and became the headquarters. Uh, while a new headquarters is now constructed, and you know it was done a little bit by the planners in the sense that they gave us the volume. And we had to make it look a little bit lighter and we made this huge atrium and the floor pla uh, plate is only 18 meters deep, which is very seldom for England. You can go up to 25 meters and never see the natural light. So that's why Google bought it and it's a beautiful, beautiful building. Um, again, about uh, combining cultures, meeting different cultures. This is the Russian Orthodox Cathedral in Paris, knowing that it's on the Seine River in a very protected area, uh, very close to the Eiffel, Eiffel Tower. So we had to do something that is completely orthodox in all the terms of the, the world, and at the same time completely uh, in in, into the tissue of, 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 the, of the Paris uh, urban plan. So, um, not easy. This is Ferrari. Um, uh, how to do uh, about uh, 50,000 square meters for five cars, racing cars per year. But you see, uh, here, the main topic, it's, I, I was asking them, 
what's the difference between Ferrari team and uh, McLaren team? Say, well, the strength of the team. I said, beside the red car. I said, yeah, the strength of the team. I said, okay, it's the red car. So this is a car which is launched 360 kilometers fast, uh, and uh, it's completely transparent from inside, but from outside, it's, uh, you cannot see anything for uh, protection. And it's like a laboratory because it's the combination between the hand and the latest technology. Because I think this is also uh, luxury and transmission is about to combine the, the work of the hand and uh, the technology of the machine. So this is the second building. And about uh, Eiffel Tower, just I wanted to show you the Grand Palais Ephemère because it's a temporary building which is just here on the Champ de Mars and it was meant to stay for three, four years, the time they uh, were restoring the Le Grand Palais, uh, a building from 1900. Um, and it's going to host a part of um, the Olympic Games, but also it's a, it's a place that you have all the exhibits and we even put uh, the sculpture of the Marichal Foch inside to, to keep it. And um, for instance, here in the car in Senegal that we have a small office as well, we finished the UN building uh, working with our local colleagues for the requirements, for the... Uh, you know, actually, the best combination is always to work with our local partners to understand the culture, the habits, the way you dress, the weather, you, the, what's the weather, what do you eat, what do you... It's, you know, you have to be, to get plunged in the culture of the country because each, pro each project should be absolutely unique. We never repeat twice. That's why we don't have speciality. And for the football um, lovers, this is the training center of Paris Saint-Germain. Uh, you have 14 uh, fields for football, volleyball, academy, and things like this. You have a bunch of uh, um, young people uh, there. This is for... Uh, ArcelorMittal, uh, this is our only Indian client, uh, but it's abroad. So they are headquarters in, um, in Luxembourg, and actually uh, it was a big international competition. We came to Mr. Mittal uh, uh, holding um, a box with five pieces of metal, steel, and, said, and we said, Mr. Mittal, you will be able to build this building, 85% of this, with these five elements and we won. So um, sometimes marketing helps also. So this is the new Pompidou Center in South Korea in Seoul. Unfortunately, it's close to a big, big, big uh, shopping mall, but the interior space, it's gonna be absolutely fantastic and it's already under construction. And speaking about luxury again, LVMH, we are doing their, um, the headquarters of Christian Dior perfumes. We've been working for them for a very, very long time in an existing building, always um, renovation and things like this. And to, to, to say that this is the first step to India, hopefully, we're on the Silk Road and we work a lot in Bukhara. We do um, the master plan of the old city of Bukhara, uh, which is under protection of UNESCO, but we also work on the place of Rajasthan in Samarkand, the Ulupek museums, uh, this is the new Silk Road Museum. You see it's completely made out of local materials and uh, things like that. And, um, and the last one, it's the Ulukbek Observatory. I think between, between uh, Uzbekistan and India, you have the best observatories in the world. Uh, and um, um, so this is where we are today. And... Uh, Thank you very much. I've been a little bit long, but it's a way to maybe to, to build a bridge. It's really impressive. It was a, a worldwide tour in, a, I think, in, a, in 10 minutes. Congratulations. It's really amazing. And I'm sure that we can go deeper in some of the project and the problematics that you started to raise. Uh, and I think some of the aspects that you were pointing out in the projects are how you connect with a culture that is local, with people, local people also, and how do you like create a connection with their reality? Because that's how our project is really working, I think, when you're abroad and when you're collaborating abroad. So I would like to ask maybe now Sonali, who is the other 
uh, architect today with us uh, and I would like to ask you Sonali like practicing in India for a long time also internationally so having this ability to compare what is the global scale and what is going on also in that country I would like you maybe to explain a bit what is the specific context according to you of India in terms of contemporary architecture with what Borina just showed, which is like global perspectives or questionings of reusing the building that are happening all over the world. Do you find that, camp, that same problematics here in India? What are, according to you, the expectations, challenges, but also do you think that an Indian style could emerge or are, has emerged already through the past decades in terms of aesthetic, material? You were showing some very specific material on your last slide about Uzbekistan that you are using. Uh, scale, also a quest for sustainable solutions. Thank you. So, um, somewhere you said that India, perhaps a continent. So I have, I have uh, the incredible opportunity of working in, th in this country, which could also be a continent, uh, because it provides me with too many clues on how to approach a project. Um, it provides me at the first space for sustainability. It provides me so many different types of climates to work in. Um, it provides me so many different types of cultural clues. It provides me so many cross influences over the centuries. And it provides me local vernacular time tested solutions. So I have to work uh, lesser in trying to discover them in most of the places this in this country we've always so of course we've worked with luxury because we've always had uh, the royals and the rulers who have always been patrons so we have worked with luxury but we have also majority of the population has worked with limited resources that respond to the climate of that region so i have both types of clues always available and um, and i'm uh, happy to say that uh, going forward from here, I see a more exciting period for architecture in India because from as the current data shows, we will be the fastest urbanizing nation in the next decade. And uh, we have some crazy billion, 10 billion number, uh, square feet to build up uh, in order to meet the needs of this urbanization. And um, what excites me today, that this population that is going to become from rural to urban, uh, we have two choices. One is to convert them into unskilled, low-paid labor, which we often do, unfortunately, or to harness the skills they will bring from the, with themselves when they migrate from their rural condition into the urban condition. And to translate those skills into proper, technologically-oriented, mass scale building applications because to do a one-off creative piece is a great example but unless these skills become something that creates large-scale employability we will not be able to absorb absorb it at all and then i want to call the next 10 years for indian architecture our chance to create a bespoke future and at that point, I will, from here, I'd like to take and show you some of what I've been doing in the past, which is now making me feel very well prepared to approach the next 10 years. And so this is some of the numbers that we are going to go from 500 million to 600 million in the next, 10 year, well, next seven years. And uh, our energy consumption which is the third highest in the world, though of course it is much lower than the global average because the first two are America and China, but it is still going to become 2x of what we are doing in just the next decade. So between understanding how from um, times immemorial we have actually worked with very less energy, well, I want to learn from that and I need to be part of this nation building exercise. 4.5 billion square feet to be built, only up to 2030. That's, that's probably larger than a lot of nations put together. So this is a five-point agenda that we have set for ourselves at the studio, Morphogenesis. 
And of this, I think in today's conversation, what is very important is socio-cultural sustainability. And here I refer to the fact that we can fall into a complete abyss and not get out of it if we do not absorb the socio-cultural nuances of the rural to urbanizing population, which is happening now as we speak. If we lose the opportunity to create a bespoke future and simply just give in to the whims of, I need this building out of New York or I need this building out of Dubai, which is quite often the case uh, which as, the, as the client requirement. But if we give in to that, we will get that, but we will lose this. Today we are in a country which still has the opportunity at this scale to be bespoke. You know? And then I call it the luxury, which will be a true luxury, because it will be a luxury involved in not just for those who afford luxury, but for an entire nation to build itself via. And tradition meets technology, that will have to happen. Because we are taking the absolute, um, I will not say uneducated, but abs mostly uneducated in what we consider high skill in luxury. Um, and we have to grow rapidly, which we can't do without technology. Don't have the liberty to make a Taj Mahal and take the time to do it and have the cost to do it, don't have that cost available either. So this goes to, this is the world's largest office building, which most, the most of the world didn't know it till CNN picked it up in December 2023. This was built in Surat, it was built during COVID. It was built not local but hyper-local because the state boundaries were closed for three and a half years, most of the three and a half years during COVID of the five years that it took to build it. So the intention was for it to be local, but it really became local. So this is part of that nation building that I'm talking about. This is the first building on the outskirts of Surat, which is hoping to get a Gurgaon or a Noida attached to it. So this is the first building which people will move into, people who travel every single day to Mumbai to work, and they spend nine hours on a train going and coming. It's for those people who got together and made a community and petitioned a building for themselves. And now the entire community that sees their family, the men see their family once a week, because every day nine hours they work and nine hours they're on a train, um, this building is for them. And they petitioned this building for themselves. It was a global competition. Uh, they got project managers who were very competent, got 30 firms from around the world, and we were fortunate that, uh, to uh, win their vote in a two-stage competition. So, and the energy consumed in this building is 50% of the Leeds Platinum Standard, for those of you who are familiar with that, which is 50% of the best accepted standards in the world. It's 50% lesser than that, because it was a necessity. The budget for the project was less than $500 per square meter. And they wanted, so we talk about cultural. The examples we were given were from Antwerp, Dubai, and Hong Kong. That the buildings have to match that quality of luxury, but they have to match it at that price. So obviously, a lot of the cost that goes into a building is in the energy. So you reduce the energy, you can meet the price. So of course, a lot of the learning comes from the local area in Gujarat and Rajasthan. Um, most of you have probably seen the jalis or the perforated fenestrations. So 50% of this building is not air conditioned and yet it meets the uh, aspirational global standard because it uses the technique of perforated walls to, uh, in the prevailing wind direction, uh, which has been used in India for centuries. And it uses what in the West is underfloor cooling. Here it was indigenized and made on site. You see in the bottom picture, it's just simple tubing with the reject water from the air conditioning going through it, which reduces the temperature by seven degrees. So we understood that diamond traders don't necessarily trade in offices, they tra trade on this. We did case studies in Mumbai. Uh, they trade under trees, they trade in parks, because their philosophy is never let a customer go. So if a customer comes to one trader and says, I need X many diamonds of this size, he says, hold on, I'm just coming, and then sends out messages, and whoever else has this diamonds brings it to them, and they trade it under a tree, and it comes back and gets given to the person. And this building 
we'll now have 92% of all diamonds in the world being partially or entirely processed in it. So 92% of every single diamond in the world now goes through this building. So we decided to use the circulation space, what I had called circulation previously in every other building I designed, uh, as a park. So this is what the circulation looks like. There isn't any corridor in this building. All of it looks like bits and pieces of parks. At the same time, we got a project, and as she talked about the size and scale, this is at, at that time the smallest project in the studio, 10,000 square feet. Um, and this is a production factory for the brand Forest Essentials, and a brand that sells in, I don't know, 60, 80, I don't know how many countries, but every single thing they make is produced in this tiny factory. This is a net zero facility, uh, again, learning to build from the locals. There wasn't any road that got here. There was no electricity supply here. When, and there still isn't any electricity supply. Uh, we are net positive on energy, so therefore it works as an evening school for the children that live on this hill as well. So it was built during COVID. So there was no construction workers because most construction workers, for those of you who are familiar with this industry in India, come from either Rajasthan or UP and Bihar. And this project was in Uttarakhand. So we understood how the locals build and use the same technology to build. And it was built by 65 workers, of which 60 were from the hill. And some of them, uh, their wives were uh, working to collect uh, herbs for the product. And the men were doing the construction. Um, so use of indigenous materials, techniques, local village labor was the core of this project. And the projects uh, with no electricity supply met each and every condition that was set by ST Lauder because they are half owners of this project. So if that can happen with zero energy intake, then I think that is the way to go world over. This is a very old project, um, 2008. Uh, we built this project. It was in an industrial park. It was a college in the industrial park. And um, very low cost of uh, project. If I remember correctly, it was something like 1,350 rupees per square foot with furniture, furnishings, everything. Uh, the only air conditioning in the building was the ones that the teachers demanded in their staff area. So about 20% of the building was air conditioned, uh, which also we used old air conditioners from their old building. The rest of the building was just passive, passive design and cooled by the water from the sewage treatment plant. Um, the technique to achieve these flat soffits without using false ceilings, because there was no material to do any of those things, was an age-old technique. It also provided employment for gentlemen like this one and this one. And now, this is something that was always done in Rajasthan. It's not something that I invented. Now I'm happy to say that all low cost or educational institution buildings, I don't know why only low cost have taken it up, but that has now uh, kind of people have remembered and they're using this technique, I'm proud to say. So you achieve these flat seamless soffits, uh, a very international sort of aesthetic, columns are just disappearing into that, but there is no false ceiling, there is no bison board, there's no gypsum, there is no such thing in this project. And the cooling is done by this water, which is entirely recycled water from the sewage treatment plant. So a standard policy for us is no water leaves our sites, like nothing in any site. It's always used back. So the baseline for the best criteria award-winning buildings for energy use is 90. We use only 25. So this is another project that I'm very, very proud of. And um, four buildings are completed out of uh, eight. Um, this is a west-facing side, and west is the side we really need to shut out in our climate. And this is in Bengal, which is like the, really the culturally rich and very culturally very proud part of our country. And art, and this is Shanti Niketan School is not far from here. And art is very much part of the mm, sort of art, poetry, is really part of the everyday conversation. So this was a um, limited competition which we won. And uh, 
the west facade which we were blocking, uh, we decided to use them for art. And we involved, we put out a newspaper ad and we got a lot of artists to come in and draw, uh, ab draw about life in Bengal. And those were then, uh, we understood that we could afford to have a certain amount of CNC cutting within our budget, uh, which meant that it could go up to a certain depth, cut twice, that's it. Any more would take us out of budget. So CNC technology meets hand. So wherever we needed the shadows to be deeper as per the art uh, that was done on site, and then it was filled with resin to make it even darker. So part machine, part man, that is the project. This is a project. So this was one that started with inspiration from tradition, really. Uh, not really saying, OK, we are going to involve craftsmen. So this is Zydus corporate headquarters. Uh, it's in a very hot part of India. And when we measured the temperature on the highway next to it, it crossed 55. Uh, so we said, OK, we really need to shut this sun out. Uh, and we decided to do a canvas, literally, a blank wall as a facade, like no opening. And so then we looked at what the materiality that we wanted to use. So one, of course, we wanted to use something that uses the sun, you know, that looks more beautiful with the sun. And the desire was to create something iconic because, again, this was kind of one of the few building, first buildings coming up in this area. So we decided to work with steel, also because Kansaras, which is a community from Ahmedabad, this, where this building is, are very famous for the steel work. So we somehow said, OK, it's the tradition of Kansaras. The mirror work is a tradition of Bhungas, which Gujarat is very famous for, the mirror work tradition. So, and mirror work is traditionally e used uh, in houses to actually uh, create the identity of the house. So ev the women of the house would do the mirror work and by the different patterns in different houses in the villages is how you would recognize which house belongs to who. So we were going to create something iconic in Gujarat. So we used the same mirror work uh, on the building to give it a certain amount of iconicism. So here then, technology meets man. So we, of course, generated... Um, parametric forms, doubly curving forms, to create this kind of sinuous, sexy kind of uh, walls. Um, then came some miscalculation mathematically, where we got this very fancy German uh, shuttering to do it, but it wasn't bending as per our estimate that it was supposed to bend, and wasn't giving us the desired curves. So. Then we, got, we said, okay, let it make as much of the wall that it does, and we'll create the extra curve in the metal itself. When the metal got cut, as per the computer, it didn't fit. So then these, these gentlemen who do this for a living were involved, and the cut pieces came from the factory, and they were bent into position and locked into our points created by the computer on the wall. And that's how the final finish came. And the mirrors were part of the entire geometry. So this is our Indian perspective in the global context and towards a net zero future. Thank you very much. I think it, it was a very, very inspiring also in terms of, I was talking about skills, materials, sustainability. I think you've covered all of that subject and on what is India looking at right now in terms of architecture and, and what, how is it to build with the people also. And I will turn now to another panelist who I was not lucky enough to introduce in the beginning, so that's going to be the perfect opportunity. So we have, you've noticed, two French panelists and two Indian panelists, and I have to welcome Jean-Louis Degnaud. Jean-Louis Degnaud is, a, is a, an architect, a French architect and interior designer, um, sorry, who studied at Camondo, Paris, if I'm correct, before creating his own agency and gaining an international reputation in architecture, interior design, and also furniture design. Uh, he has a specific talent, you'll see, for mixing style and references, so we are also switching, I was telling you today, in different universes, because you'll see it's, uh, it's very different. We were on the craft, you're also working with craft, so maybe that's an interesting parallel to draw. 
and uh, you have projects which include many residential spaces, private houses, as well as restaurants, private clubs, hotels around the world, including India. And that's where I want to start, maybe, is with your relationship to India. Because you've been building some houses there, and I was curious to start, because your work is very diverse around the world, but what do you find specific also to India in the different projects you've come across? What is, how would you define also the Indian taste and what Indian clients you've been working with are looking at in terms of interior design, in terms of architecture, and also the styles, references that you use? Would you define like a specific approach uh, of the Indian client and taste in your work to start with? Thank you. And thank you for being here. India is probably my, my favorite destination because just to cut the story short, it's probably the only destination where we don't never talk about price. And it's so refreshing because as soon as you use uh, local material and local handcraft and, uh, and just your sense of creativity, then you can, you can literally create and produ produce anything you want without ever doing value engineering, you know, and which obviously damage, you know, the level of creativity and all that, you know, so uh, India, India in my heart is a, is a very special place. Uh, let's not forget, you know, that, uh, that uh, Indians has been fantastic um, uh, patrons, you know, for jewelry, you know, and for art and, 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 since, and since many centuries. And so we have, uh, we, we have also, you know, a lifestyle in common, so I think L'art de vivre à la française, you know, it's actually not very far at all, you know, from l'art de vivre à l'indienne. And uh, when you look, for example, at the, at the weddings, uh, the weddings are, it's, it's a typical representation of how the aristocratic families were actually living in the 18th century. Uh, displaying the jewelry, displaying the flowers, displaying the food, you know, and treating the guests, you know, as, as kings and queens. And, uh, and so it's wonderful to still see this, you know, in the 21st century. Um, I've been working in India since 20 years now, uh, between Delhi, uh, Chandigarh, and uh, recently Hyderabad. Uh, in Delhi, uh, we did three projects, one in Defense Colony, one in Chattapur Farm, and one in West and Green, and, uh, and hopefully more to come. Yes, so I, I guess the presentation is... Um, is uh, Eastern, you know, so it's it's really towards Asia. So we don't we don't show, you know, anything, you know, uh, west. We tend to go uh, east. Uh, this is to show you the the images are very squ squeezed, cropped, not just squeezed, oh. you know. But I guess it looks with taller, even taller ceiling, you know. Okay, um, <laughs> that's that's an apartment in Paris. It's just to show the eclecticism, you know, between. Uh, uh, with the 16 background, you know, and uh, and uh, and the way the the way you can be quite decomplexed about it. So, for example, the mural to the right is a is a French lady, a French artist, who uh, who did that kind of abstract, which because it's it's got the view on the Tuileries. So I asked her to do like an abstract version, you know, of the Tuileries. Um, yeah, I I don't know, just a position of shapes and materials and finishes. Uh, another, mat another apartment in Paris. It's to show also, in my mind, where the, where the French taste is going towards to, you know? And the French taste has always been quite eclectic because, you know, all the French houses have been collecting pieces, you know, from generation and centuries. So the French taste is very, very much about accumulation of time, you know, and accumulation of styles. I think what is very interesting in your work, and you can explain through this portfolio, is how you mix the references and the different times of the French history also in your work. Yes. And how you, you're able to, to mix all of this reference and then b bring it to India. That's also yes. interesting. Thank you. Um, I think, you know, in order to create, you need to, you need to be aware of what's been done in the past. And the, the more you're aware of what's been done in the past, the more you can actually play with it, make reference to it, and, uh, and, and feeling actually creative because you know if it's a pale copy of something which has been done before or if, it, or if it's something which is actually innovative, you know. Um, I love literally every style, you know, and so uh, everything is recorded in my brain and, and when I need to pick from a specific style, I just, I just go in one of those boxes, you know, and I, 
and I pick from there. You know, I, I don't have a computer. I have 40 computers at the office, but I don't have personally a computer, uh, probably purposely, because uh, all my memory is in my head. You know, it's in my brain, and, uh, and I can literally remember everything and make reference to everything. And, uh, and I love that because it, just with a paper and a pen, you know, you can, and then being in India with a pile of wood, a pile of marble, and a pile of plaster. Uh, you can create wonders. Uh, in India, I, I like taking in consideration, you know, the, the historical side of India. You know, I like every exercise to be uh, extremely uh, location-oriented, so it belongs. And, uh, and so I make sure that whatever are the influences or the, uh, uh, or the, uh, in the design, that, uh, that it take in consideration uh, the sense of legitimacy. So it belongs in the place, you know, and I think sustainable design is, uh, is actually timeless design. It's design that you don't need to demolish, that you don't need to redo something which lasts. I think that's, that's, uh, that's sustainable, yes. Uh, another flat in Paris, same thing, you know, it's to, how do you define, you know, uh, 21st century neoclassicism? Uh, still using the technique, you know, of what get used in the past, you know, which is plaster, which is uh, lac lacquer, which is, you know, obviously woodwork, paneling, um, but in a slightly more contemporary way. That's on Ile Saint-Louis. So here it's uh, slightly more historical. There was a teeny piece of paneling in the room, and before demolishing the entire apartment, I made sure to... Uh, to take a comb and to take the print of the of the molding, you know, so it same thing. So it, it had some sense of legitimacy because everything you see uh, in all the architectural details are, have been brought in. Uh, rarely anything is actually existing, but I, I like the sense of disappearing behind the exercise. That's another apartment uh, for a Saudi princess. I decided to show, you know, yeah, French things, you know, because like that you, you can tell where we are, you know, with, uh, with the French style. And showing uh, French influences and, and the different amazing apartments you've done uh, in Paris, you think like uh, when you work worldwide in India and in other country, people were coming to you for their design and their apartment, the place they are looking at this style is it a french style is it your style what are they I think looking it's more at lifestyle you know it's really the the french art de vivre you know i think that's what they can read as a common thread you know through the exercises and uh, and like that you design specifically for each family because each family is, is unique so each design is unique and and what you bring is is actually a certain je ne sais quoi you know uh, uh, this art de vivre you know that's the house we're currently building in, uh, in Bangkok for an Indian family. So it's missing all the greenery, you know, because there's uh, their extended greenery coming up. But uh, that's a paneling which is made by uh, Feo. So it's, uh, you see, it's, it's we, think, we think of Feo, you know, being very classical, you know, and actually Feo can, can produce, you know, any style of paneling. That's made locally as a as a winter garden, you know, it's, uh, so you can tell that it's slightly Asian infused, you know. Uh, library, same thing, you, s you see, you can tell, you feel in Asia. We tend to show, you know, all the 3Ds to clients uh, just for the architecture first. Uh, we, we tend to never actually furnish, you know, the, um, the 3Ds. Uh, that's an apartment we did uh, in Bangkok. So same thing, you, you can tell that there's a sense of symmetry, like French do, but there's also a French of, uh, of age, a sense of Asia, you know. Here the walls are made out of crackled um, lacquer to mimic uh, ivory. Uh, that's field paneling also. Uh, that, that paneling is, uh, is a new edition of the Ruhlmann uh, paneling that uh, Guillaume Feo has. For those who missed at the beginning and the introduction, we are standing in a room with some of these panels from the same film company, so enjoy it. <laughs> so.
So you see this sense of origami, you know, on the ceiling, because when you think Asia, you know, you feel wild Asia, you know, why not taking things, you know, from the Japanese, you know, or taking things, it's, it's okay. I, I think it's always okay to mix, you know. And the crazy pool at the top, uh, which is uh, yeah, there's no there's no second uh, second image sadly, but you know it's literally you have a slab over the over the top floor pool, which is great because when you are in the, in hot weather like that, it means that you can actually swim, you know, without having the the direct sun, and uh, and and it feels very naturalistic, and it's uh, on the 28th floor, so you see you have a, a great view on the on the Bangkok skyline. That's a project we are uh, currently doing in Taiwan. Um, we have Rem Kulas, so we're responsible for all interiors. I get systematically inspired by the architecture. It's, it's very important because I, I like the idea uh, to show the architect that we're highly respecting his, uh, his work. So, uh, so here uh, he, he's been using a lot of stainless steel, so we introduced those uh, Asian gates you see as portals. Um, and then he was introducing uh, also curves on the outside, so I went, you know, for those Zen, the idea of the Zen gardens, you know, for those, uh, those floor patterns. That's the parking area, because even the park, because nowadays, you know, people arrive by car, you know, so in a way the parking area is, and you have a car lift, uh, is actually almost more important than the, the main lobby some of the reception rooms, the hangout bar, same thing, you see, in my mind, you know, you feel in Taiwan, you know. Dining room, I love playing with verticality and I must say with that display, you know, of picture, it's even more stretched, so it's, uh, <laughs> it's totally to my liking. <laughs> Library, so you see, for example, the coffered ceiling is actually coming from the rhythm of the facade, you know, so Rem Kulas came up with that, those comb in the facade, so I just stretched the comb on the inside, so like that there's a direct relation between his architecture and my interiors. That's a house that we're currently building uh, in Hyderabad, so the idea of that house is to have actually all the gardens on the, on the roof. That's the most, more refined version. They wanted something which was quite Rajasthan um, oriented. And, um, and I think in India we should use the roof, you know, for gardens because it, uh, it, it pulls you from the ground, it pulls you away, you know, from the, the traffic, it, it brings you towards the, the stars, you know, and, uh, and I think uh, a roof are underutilized. And actually, once you plant the roof, it would be actually a good way to keep the whole building cool, yes. That's a small plot, you know, small plot, but ve very narrow, but very, uh, very long. That's some of the, of the view from the inside because you have an internal courtyard. And that's the idea, you know, of, uh, of how it will look like, you know, once, uh, once it's all done. That's a, a house we, which is almost completed in Chandigarh. Um, which I clad it in white marble, in Indian white. I, I wondered, you know, everyone's fascinated with the Taj Mahal in here, you know, but for any reason, no one is using Indian white, you know, to clad their houses. And, uh, and so we did there. So the idea of, uh, of that house is, uh, is a mix of neoclassicism and brutalism, you know, so because initially they literally wanted Versailles, uh, which in my mind was not possible to achieve there. And so, and so we arrive at the compromise, you know, between Versailles and, and Le Corbusier. So those are early pictures because it's been, it's been uh, much more progress since. I'm sorry, you, you won't see many images because uh, I just think that it's just like plastic surgery, you know, you never take pictures during, you know, you take only pictures when it's, uh, when it's far down, you know. That's the back of the house. And that's the sense of, uh, of internal courtyard. Uh, that's uh, some of the first house I built here in Delhi, so uh, it was quite early, you see, 2009. Um, in reference to Lutens, because same thing, you know, they wanted a French house, and same thing, I don't want it to catapult a French house here in Delhi, it won't make sense. 
So uh, I made uh, I made reference to Lutens. It's all made out of cement. It's painted, and um, that's where I'm staying when I'm in Delhi. And I, I'm lucky enough to stay there, you know. And it it's quite magical. So here the paneling, everything was done locally. Uh, all the furniture was made locally. Nothing was imported. All the art uh, was also uh, commissioned locally. The paneling is made out of teak. Some can see the reference of uh, Chateau de Grousset, you know, with the, with the flooring in the winter garden. The client had a fit, you know, when I put a $50, you know, jute rug on top of the marble. You know, he, he could not understand. Now, now he gets it, you know, but... Uh, Same thing, Indian marble, Indian black, Indian white. A bedroom, which is a little tied to Sremar, to give a slightly more Art Deco uh, reference. Dining room, uh, which makes reference to Malmaison, thanks to great, you know, Indian craftsmanship who could paint, you know, all those, uh, all those ni nice details. And you see a uh, rug design, you know, with references to bindis, guest rooms. And that's another house that I'm finally completing now, as we speak, just went by. And, uh, and I can't wait to photograph this one. It's the same thing. It's a labor of love to about eight years, you know, to put together. But amazing sense of scale. Look at that corridor. You can't even see the end of it. It's a, actually an exterior corridor. And as you can see, you know, all the technology is always hidden. You know, the air conditioning vent, uh, uh, the, you know, any, any technology. It, it takes so much time to make so many of those ugly details disappear. Uh, P.O.P. Plaster of Paris, Indian can do that in their sleep, thanks to them, you know, because then you can create anything you, which comes to your mind. That's the back of the house. The entrance, which is uh, cladded with a, with a local travertine, as a great temple. And amazing marble work, look how it's just like, I, I'm, I'm amazed, you know, with the level of craftsmanship in this country. It's fantastic. The internal courtyard, which was entirely cladded also with green marble. And my new book, and voila. <laughs> I, I would like to, yeah, thank to, thank you, to thank you very much for this visual journey, because it's, uh, I think all, all of you were really enjoying it. And maybe... Now I, I switch to, to someone that I, I will call my chameleon in a, bit, in a way because he's able to, to speak about many subjects when it comes to style. And I think Jean-Louis has been showing us also the importance of material. It was also very present in the presentation we had before by Sonali and in a sense also with the more global vision that was given to us in the first place by Borena. And I think my question and what I want to hear you today about is, of course, your work, your creative process as a designer, but more specifically, your relationship to the sculptural aspect of thing and the architectural aspect of thing, you know, because you, you, we've been hearing interior designer, architecture, architecture, well, from managers also. And I want to know, like, you have similar question actually, that you're asking at the scale of the body, which is the volume, the colors, the material, but also the craft techniques. We've been talking a lot about craft, and I know it's a, it's a common point with your work. So what is your relationship more globally to architecture and design in your creative process? Your last couture show in Paris, for example, and I'm not sure everybody knows about this, but was happening at the American Church of Paris, which is an amazing building I discovered thanks to you. I didn't know that building myself. And it's a very specific setting for showcasing your design. So what was also the process in you getting into an architectural space? What is the dialogue and the conversation you have with the space when you show your work there? Hi. <laughs> Hi. 
Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me here. Firstly, congratulations, all three of you. It was fantastic. I don't have, uh, I don't have a presentation like the three of them at all, which I was just like totally not prepared. And they're like, I was like, oh, my God, sitting here amazed with all the work that they've been showcasing. Um, I was like, oh, we're just going to chat. Well, we, uh, this is one of our signature looks from Paris Couture Week. This is, uh, we do sculpting. I'm known as um, a couturier fashion designer who is more like a sculptor. So I tend to sculpt around the body and make newer shapes and forms. And I've never seen things as, um, you know, as, as just boring pattern making or the way everybody just wears shirts and jeans all over the world. I want to kind of um, create my own new language. I'm trying to create my own new language in... Um, in shape and form and fashion and a philosophy altogether. So it's kind of creating a whole new parallel universe. It's almost couture also allows you to do that, escape from everyday life and everyday wear, uh, every like day wear, and you kind of challenge notions around wearability, fashion, culture, cultural overlaps, or philosophies around design altogether. So that's where I find couture really fascinating. And um, in that sense, I could kind of relate more to the philosophies of like Zaha Hadid or somebody like that in architecture where I don't follow like straight lines or, um, you know, functionality seen in a different way altogether. And, but I do see, um, also I find couture quite sustainable in that sense. A, this is all done in India. It's done with my, I employ about 550 people. Um, they make our own, uh, we come up with our own techniques. A lot of times people think that our things are not Indian just because they don't look Indian. A lot of these techniques actually, some things are head, which you'll see. Actually, this was actually an elephant that we did for um, King Charles. It was, uh, he's king now, he was a prince then. Prince Charles, he, was, he has this charity called the Elephant Family. And this was done, maybe it was done for the same chocolate factory that yeah. you have in, yeah. oh no, maybe. Can it, anyways, this was in London though. That was in Paris. So this was, um, these get auctioned uh, and yep. the money goes towards charity. I just wanted to show, you can see some of these cultural garments. Mm. What is fascinating about context here in, in this conversation would be, like when I came back to India about 20 years back from St. Martin's, um, Indian fashion was all about wearing lengas and traditional clothes, etc. Today, an Indian bride wears one of those cultural gowns to her reception, Indian reception or an Indian cocktail. For me, that is, that is actually having a, I've been having as a brand, having a deeper cultural conversation for with the, with the fashion or a design mindscape of this country, where I'm just like, okay, today there is, there are thousands of brands copying the sculpting technique or this aesthetic and want aspiring to be there and want to wear that to their weddings. It's not that I've, I've fucked it up forever or messed it up forever, but there are, there are other aspects to it as well. Because this is actually one of our dresses that we did with IBM, which combines technology. Um, it has this Watson lights, um, and it studies your personality online, and it, the lights change color according to your personality. So it was a project that I did with IBM and Watson. It was just, I just have random pictures in here, not presentations prepared like these guys. <laughs> So this is from our first um, Paris show in, um, in Paris. This was, the show was called Shunya. So our concepts are very Indian. For, my, for me, the philosophy of India, the ancestry and the, you know, it's, I feel like when India is seen a lot of times um, globally, it's seen for colorful embroidery or, or gold embroidery or, you know, or Taj Mahal or yeah. things like that. Where, whereas I want to challenge that because India is so much more than that. Or, why does, act, why does it actually have to be defined as Indian? Yeah, you and know, I think it's a, it's a very important question, which is about identity. And we've yeah. been like going around this subject with all the panelists, and I'm very interested because I know it's something you care about. It's like, would you define yourself as an Indian designer or not? Because your style might not seem so Indian in the cliche that we have, and you maybe don't like to be stuck in that box also, in that label. I, you know, the thing is, I 
don't like any boxes, so I don't even know if I'm gay or not. The thing is, you know, it's like I, could, I would not be, when you were saying you're the only man in the panel, I would not like to be defined as a man, but now we have another man here as well. But, you know, the thing is, I feel like I happen to be from India. I'm lucky that I am from India because I understand a deeper sense. There's a deep, there is a deep sense of spirituality, of ancestry, of, of history, of tradition, and of, of a certain, um, a certain psych, you know, anthropology and philosophy which which I've grown up with but that doesn't mean that I don't imbibe a global culture or create new fantasy or, or create new cultures altogether because I feel like sometimes we tend to refer too much to what has happened in the past and for me I want to break free from that so for me I li I'd like to not define my work within one box or a pertain box at all this was actually this collection was called Shunya and Shunya is uh, zero in Sanskrit and uh, zero was discovered in India about 5,000 or a few, many more thousand years ago. And before that, there was only positives, one, two, three, and there was no negative. So for me, the concept was Shunya infinity. And for me, the biggest cultural win was that influencers or bloggers, who a lot of, a lot of us like or don't like, all over the world on social media were describing Shunya the concept. So for me, as an artist, that was a bigger win than just the art itself, when they are able to understand a concept of zero and an artist concept and explain it, especially in something like fashion, um, where especially an Indian designer showcasing in Paris, at Paris Couture Week for the first time and for people all over the world. There were people from Norway or Russia or Korea picking up that concept and but explaining it. This concept could be translated also in architecture and design. Exactly, exactly. So that is, so obviously these clothes are you know, very architectural and they, they go around the three dimension of the body and it doesn't follow any rules in that sense. This is from the recent collection. And we also, you know, these also have multiple processes. Our garments are, const are actually like buildings, if you actually, are complicated buildings because it is, the, the fabric is made with traditional techniques of corsetry, then we sculpt, then we embroider it with these bugle beads that come in from Korea or Japan and then crystals that come from somewhere else. It's, it's, it's a random, artistic, free-flowing couture process. And then the hood is a, is a reference to a ghungat or a veil uh, in India as well. So it's, it's taking, it's almost like um, having a parallel cultural conversation. This is from another show which, call, which was called Hiranyagarb. And Hiranyagarb is the golden womb out of which the whole universe was born. That was the concept. So I tend to have very, a subliminal um, Vedic, almost like ancient Vedic concepts, and then do very, f almost like, I also describe my work a lot of times as future primitive, because it's almost like very futuristic, but it has all of this embroidery on this is a dozy technique, which I'm sure we all use as embroiders, and it's all, uh, you know, very fine metal coil techniques, which is done with, uh, in, with, with hand. This was uh, a recent show, uh, a recent presentation where we have done metal casting for the first time and we use that in clo clothes as well. And funnily enough, people actually want to buy this and I'm like, wow. <laughs> and <laughs> and you know, th th that's the thing for me, it's actually been a very interesting journey as a designer because it's like um, I've been pushing the variability of product and um, I have had clients, like literally I could actually sell 50 of these, which is surprising within India, mm. you know, if I have that. So I'm just, I'm just, for me, I think the larger conversation is, a, for me has been a very deep cultural conversation of where do they put context and what is, is the history, is this, is this Greek, is this Roman, is this French or is this Indian? So for me, it's actually all these cultures combining as one larger history plate or a future plate and com combining into one. Um, this is the show in the church yeah. that you were talking about. Um, I just found that, you know, I did the first two shows at Palladi Tokyo, all, um, and then this church was, a, uh, this show was here. And, um, and just for those who don't know, Pali Tokyo is a very more modern, contemporary, brutalist architecture. Yes, exactly. So it's very natural to show your work, I would say, in that environment. This one is more unexpected, I would say, you know, like it's, but it's also very gothic, very, but. Yeah, well, 
Oh, we were not supposed to show that nipple, it did show. So, <laughs> um, it's just, you know, actually, if you see the second jacket, that's inspired by the Kundalini, and it has all these snakes on it. Uh, there are these Indian inspirations, and we literally put that snake in the church and in one of our social media posts as, as inspiration as well. Um, it was just, the, it was a beautiful location right in the center of Paris. We have to make it convenient for all the couture media and buyers that come from all over the world. And it just uh, came, I, also the fact that, you know, I wanted to, for me, when, when we were scouting the locations, it was like, it is, I'd wanted to, I'd, I want people to not perceive me as Indian. It isn't an American church. They don't want, I don't want them to perceive me as Hindu or a particular religion. So I just feel like it's a beautiful Gothic building and it kind of is, plays a, as a great background. And if people have other cultural connotations to it, then you know it's like good for them. <laughs> so this is from the church. This is that same similar garment which we had. This is the opening look. And and also we have models who are from all nationalities in our show, literally this French girl, uh, Ombeline, she's beautiful, she opened our show. <clears throat> it's a bolero jacket embroidered with, and this is a sari reference, so this draping comes in, in fact, I don't know if we have that slides further, this is from the recent show as well. So that is, this, is, this sculpting technique has become kind of a signature as well, uh, which has been burned globally now by, and these are chakras, so from our recent collection called Arohanam, Arohanam uh, literally means ascending, and that has the subliminal inspirations from the chakra, so I wanted to just represent the chakras in a very direct, modern way on, on the model's body as well. Ooh, you just put backstage pictures there. So. <laughs> Um, you see the snakes and the birds intertwining in the metal casting. On the bus, that's also coming from Kundalini. This is Beyonce recently with her album launch. She wore the look from Arohanam as well. So I'm in that unique position today, which is, again, Beyonce actually wore one of our sari gowns, a sari gown, which is a concept that we came up with about 15 years back. Before that, people in India was wearing only saris. Open, a sari is a is a piece of cloth, which you wrap in 600 different ways in the country. And a lot of women had stopped wearing saris, or, they, or only the traditional ones were wearing saris. So now the young, cool, sexy girl, we made it knotted, sexy, Grecian, zipped up, so one can just zip it up and wear it. And that, a lot of cross-cultural weddings happening all over the world, like a French guy getting married to an Indian girl, or vice versa, is wearing that zip-up sari and is easy to wear it, and still has that cultural context to it. Like that, actually that's the one. So on the left you see um, Beyonce in, at, the, at a Renaissance store, which was, I don't know, everybody here should know about the Renaissance store, right, yeah. And this became the National Atla Beyonce Day in Atlanta because she opened Atlantic, uh, in Atlanta with this, uh, with this outfit and the Ren Renaissance film opens with this outfit as well. So this is actually a sari gown. You see the drape and the hood and the referencing from that. It has a, it has a sculpting, but it's, it's sexy and it's Beyonce. And Priyanka Chopra recently wore this sari as well. She actually made it sexier with the lining being shorter when I tried it on her recently for her Bulgari uh, appearance in India recently. And that's Shakira in our sculpted outfit, um, looking like a lioness. That she is. Um, that's also a big Bollywood actress, Alia. For me, this is important because today, every girl aspires to be like her in this country, and our, you know, a lot of, and she is today a Gucci brand ambassador globally as well. So there's a lot of cross-cultural conversation happening, and if a girl is looking at her from, let's say, a small town in India, or, or in, you know, or an Indian girl, an NRI somewhere in Birmingham, wants to look like this. So she's able to relate to a new aesthetic from an Indian brand, not necessarily Indian for her. Not just Cardi at our show. Yeah. I think we can really uh, give a round of applause and really thank all of our panelists for this amazing presentation that they've been giving.
Um, I don't know if most of you knew all of their work and their practices and their style and the different projects they've been involved in. I can imagine it's a lot to process also now and you're going to have like many questions and, and many thoughts about the different images, the different consideration also and, and, and even but I feel we can only take unfortunately because we are the first conference and we're already running a bit late and we have other panelists who are here ready to jump on the stage and, and I would like maybe to take one or two questions and then leave you the possibility to continue that conversation with most of our panelists around the tea time uh, at, uh, at five, uh, five fifteen later on or around uh, a cocktail tonight. So really it's just to make it like open for one or two questions if someone is willing to. Ah, I see Christelle. Hello, thank you for all your presentations. It was really interesting. I'm Christelle Clairville. I represent La Maison Gaston, so I'm over there. I have a question about um, what you said about the French taste. So I'm from a French island in the Caribbean. And so when you talk about French taste and mixing influences, I would like to know how you manage to mix also all the different kinds of French tastes. Wow. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't, that's, the, that's a very complicated question, you know, <laughs> it's just like, you know, there's so many things you just do naturally, thank God, you know, because otherwise, you know, things need to come naturally. I don't know, the thing is, whatever are the components, you know, you can always try out, you know, is you have the components, you know, try the association, see if something's happening, see if something's exciting, live with it for a while, change the, change the, 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 the composition, you know, later on, you know, is, I, I realize with age, you know, that, uh, Sometimes you think that uh, the first answer is the right answer. You know what? Uh, the second one can actually be actually better. So make some room for second thoughts, you know, and uh, uh, try not to be perfect, you know, try to... Making a mistake, a, 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 a taste mistake, you know, is, uh, can be actually very exciting and very, uh, and very surprising. And, uh, and I think if, if you get pieces, you know, from family, you know, uh, Eritans or something like that, you know. Uh, I think it, the juxtaposition of style, you know, make make them exist even more. You know, it gives them a, a second life, and so that's that's what I like, you know, with uh, with mixing uh, styles and periods. And as mentioned, you know, the the French houses, you know, has been composed out of layering and layering and layering of uh, of collections, you know, from ancestors, you know, and uh, generations. And, uh, and you can always edit it and always, you know, put it in a different uh, organization and, uh, and, and it, it keeps getting exciting at all time, you know. Second question and last Hi, question. Uh, Thank good you. evening, myself, K.L. Rathor. I am a documentary filmmaker. Uh, would you find out any similarity between French ar architecture and Indian architecture? Any similarities? In the repertoires of the French and Indian yeah. architectures, Borina maybe. You know, there are so many common things. Uh, today I visited an office of a, of a very good friend and I see what you presented. I think we, are, we have very different architects within our own country. Mm -hmm. But we have sim much more similarity with you or some other Indian architect than with some of our French colleagues. Why? Because, you know, we spoke about the same thing, about the sourcing, about the local materials. We all try to make things happen, uh, you know, no more than 15 minutes from your uh, house, you know, the work. Uh, we try to source the materials in a perimeter of hundreds uh, kilometers, b which makes sense. So I think all the reflection that you have about uh, what is really sustainable, sustainability is not to put a, a, a green wall uh, with plants that would never survive in France, or what you said, that it's really something that 
it comes naturally. And the, the real sustainability is to build something that lasts. And it doesn't go out of fashion because it's really never too much into fashion. And what I saw in your work, because you're an architect of the real architect, I, I think, it's something that you can wear now in 20 years or you could have wear 20 years before. And it's, it's still is going to have the same chic, the same look and it's, it doesn't go out of fashion. And what you should, I mean, I'm very happy that we have four of us at, oh, at that panel because uh, it might have looked a little bit odd to, to be the four of us together, but actually we are all talking the same That's language. It. It's about respect, about making people happy, about be as close as possible to the ground, and even in the opulence to be frugal, because the luxury is in the light, in the volume, in the perception, in the simplicity, and uh, you don't need too much money to make things luxury because lux is something that it's very specific and so uh, I'm very happy. Thank, Thank you. you. I, I couldn't I hope to add to that. It's basically the opulence in the, I think the, the balance of minimalism and maximalism which is in both the cultures mm -hmm. historically and, and continues to be like how you see here in this beautiful simple yet tasteful tent you have this opulent chandelier. And that is very, uh, that has a resonance in Indian history and mindset as well. So there is, I think there is a cultural similarity. And that is why there is a similarity in the architecture and the way we perceive things. And thank I can, you, I can you. only agree with that. And uh, unfortunately, so I, I would like to thank you all because this is, serves perfectly the conclusion, I think, uh, of that conversation in a sense that there is more dialogue to be built also between the four of you, all of us here, on how to really continue this dialogue of creativity, shapes, materials, sustainability, time, what is lasting. I think we have to, to work on that all together. And I would like to thank you once again, uh, and if you can give a big round of applause to them before we switch <laughs> to the other panel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you. Thank you.